OK, can you see chapter 36? Yes, yes. OK, so chapter 36, this is another thing that you guys have to do a lot, and it is called moisture control. So um, you have to maintain the operating field for the dentist to see. So again, the objective is to maintain an intraoral environment that keeps the operating field free of excess water, saliva, blood, two fragments, and excess dental materials. So these things that I'm about to speak with you to, you must know these like the back of your hands. So please study them. The first thing is the saliva ejector. It's a small straw-shaped oral evacuator used during less invasive dental procedures. Uh, the indications for use, preventative procedures such as prophylaxis, fluoride treatment, sealant placement, control of saliva and moisture accumulation under the dental dam, cementation of a crown or bridge, orthodontic bonding procedures, and it looks like this. So this is your saliva ejector. When you give it to the patient, you want to curve it like a candy cane. Don't over bend it because then it'll have a crease and think about it if you ever use a garden hose if you crease the garden hose guess what happens it doesn't work so the same thing happens with the saliva ejector if you crease it too much it's not going to take out the saliva okay now the placement of saliva ejector again you want to bend and shape the saliva ejector for stationary placement position the ejector under the tongue where most fluids accumulate Position the ejector opposite the side of which the dentist is working. So I know the PowerPoint says under the tongue, a lot of people put it like on the cheek side all the way in the back to get what accumulates in the back. It, you know, when you're working on a patient, you're going to find the best area to put it in, okay? Just as long as it's out of the doctor's way. The next one that you guys need to know is the high volume evacuator. For short, we call it HVE. This is used for most dental procedures, especially when you're using the dental handpiece. Anytime the doctor picks up that dental handpiece, you want to make sure that you pick up the HVE. You want to make sure that you keep the mouth free of saliva, blood, water, and debris. You can also use it to retract the tongue and cheek away from the field of operation, and it reduces bacterial uh, aerosol caused by the high-speed handpiece. Some of them have these little suction tips um, that are designed with a straight or slight angle in the middle, bevel working in. They're made of durable, durable plastic or stainless steel. Of course, if you're using the plastic, it's disposable. The stainless steel, you have to autoclave it. There's one also that is uh, solely for surgical because it has a much smaller circumference and uh, again, this one says it comes in stainless steels, but it does come in plastic also. Now, this is how you would hold the HVE, okay? There's two ways. The most common way is the palm uh, thumb grasp, the thumb to nose grasp, okay? So you have the HVE in your palm, and your thumb should be like almost pointing upward towards your nose because the handle um, to turn it on and off is right there. So it's, it's much easier if you use it that way. On occasion, when you're in the mouth and you have to get to certain areas, you can hold it as a pen uh, grass, but the first one on top, the thumb to nose grass, is the most common one. Now, um, as I mentioned to you, that's either way. And again, it either provides the dental system with control of the tip, which is necessary for patient comfort and safety. When you position it, you want to place the evacuator before the dentist positions the handpiece and mouth mirror. So what you should do is look in the chart so you know where he's going to be working and what tooth. Position the HVE on the surface of the operative tooth closest to you. You're going to position the tip as close as possible to the tooth being worked on. But you don't want to be on top of the tooth because if the doctor is drilling that tooth, the handpiece and the HVE, is going to keep hitting each other and you're not going to give him enough room and he's going to be uh, a little bit annoyed with you. So always work a tooth like behind him, 
okay, posterior to him. Why? Because the water goes to the back of the mouth. You don't want to be in the front. You want to be in the back because the back, um, you know, the water flows to the back. The only time you want to be in the front, if he's working on a front tooth and the water is going outside of the mouth, okay? And then again, position the bevel tip parallel to the tooth sur surface and keep the edge of the tip even or slightly beyond the occlusal surface or incisal edge. Now, here is some areas. So if he's in the front on the facial side, you're on the lingual. Same thing on the bottom. If he's in the front, you're on the lingual. Now, if he's on the opposite, say he's on the lingual, then you're on the facial. So you're going to always be the opposite of where he's at, okay? The HVE must undergo daily upkeep to maintain proper working order. The specific guidelines include follow infection control policies when handling contaminated items, Flush the hoses at the end of the day with an antimicrobial solution. Check the disposable traps weekly and replace it if needed. Open the saliva ejector hoses and clean or replace the screens as needed. Once you come into the lab, I will show you all that. But again, it's all about, you know, making sure that um, you're following the guidelines. Rinsing the oral cavity maintains a clear operating field for the dentist that keeps the patient comfortable. There's two types of rinsing, limited area where it's performed frequently throughout a procedure and it's accomplished quickly and efficiently. So say he's working on a tooth and you see that it, there's a lot of blood, rinse out the area for him so he can see. And then on occasion, full mouth rinse freshens the patient's entire mouth and you usually do it at the end of a procedure. And sometimes we do it if the patient says that their mouth is starting to become dry. In a way, that's good because that means that we're doing our job in keeping the saliva uh, out of their mouth. The bad thing is if they take a lot of medication, then they always have dry mouth and then they always want you to rinse out their mouth. Now, the air water syringe, this is another thing that you guys must know, just like your saliva ejector and your HVE, like the back of your hand, okay? So it's used for convenience and accuracy to complete the rinsing process. The guidelines, you direct the tip toward the tube being treated. Keep a close distance between the operative site and the syringe tip. Use air on the mouth mirror continuously when indirect vision is in involved. So if the doctor is using the mirror to see and you see that the mirror is getting full of tooth uh, debris, uh, decay, you need to rinse it out for him so he can continue working. When you hear the handpiece stop, rinse and dry the site. And when completing a limited area of full mouth rinse, move the tip while spraying the area. Again, we'll practice that also. But my main thing is when you come to the lab, you need to know the, the items. So if I say pick up the air water syringe, pick up the HV, pick up the saliva ejector, you need to know those, okay, before you come into the lab. So really study those. Isolation of teeth. So the criteria for isolation techniques include the following, easy to apply, protect soft and hard tissues, comfortable for the patient, retraction, so that way we have better visualization, prevention of moisture contamination, and isolation of that area that we're working on. Cotton rolls. So the advantages of cotton rolls, easy application, no additional equipment is required. It's very flexible and it permits adaptation to different areas of the mouth. But the disadvantages is that it doesn't provide complete isolation. It doesn't protect the patient from aspiration. So if we're not careful, the cotton roll can run down the back of their throat, may stick to the oral mucosa. So when their mouth gets really dry, if the cotton roll, when you're gonna take it out, if you see that it's sticking to the cheek or the lip, don't pull it, wet it, and then pull it out because if you pull it, you actually take some of their cheek, cheek and lip with you, the tissue, and it'll leave them raw on the inside. So always wet it a little bit. Now, if it does become saturated, if it's too wet, replace them and then limit it retraction. So here is how the cotton roll should look. So one here is on the lingual, one is on the buckle, Okay, in the posterior area of the mouth. 
on the top, you would only be able to put it on the buckle or the facial. We can't put it on the lingual because there's nothing to hold it there and it would fall and choke the patient. There's something called cotton roll holders. Now, a lot of offices don't have this. We just put it in the mouth. But if they do, they come in metal or plastic and they hold the uh, cotton roll. Uh, dry angle, now that we use, they look like little pads to help isolate posterior areas in the maxillary and mandibular arches. The, plat the pad is placed over Stenson's duct, which extends from the parotid gland opposite the maxillary second molar. These pads block the flow of saliva and protect the tissue in this area. It replaces pads if they become soaked before um, the procedure has been completed. So these dry angles are uh, sort of like sanitary napkins. Um, they absorb, and once they get um, soaked, you just take them out and you replace them. The other isolation that some doctors use is called the dental dam. It is a thin, stretchable latex material that acts as a barrier when appropriately applied to selected teeth. When the dam is in place, only selected teeth are visible through the dam. Dental dam indications for use. It's a good infection control barrier, safeguard for the patient's mouth, protection from accidental inhalation or swallowing of debris, protection from contamination for the tooth, moisture control device, tool with which to improve access, to improve visibility, and to increase dental team efficiency. Uh, I will tell you this, most doctors that use the dental dam is when they use root canals, when they do root canals. If they do root canals, then they use the dental dam because when they do root canals, the tooth has to be extremely uh, isolated. Give me one second and turn on the light. Okay, dental dam equipment. So the material comes uh, latex or latex free. It comes in six by six or five by five. Usually six by six is for adults and five by five is for children. They come in different colors. Dark is preferred because of the contrast. They come in scents and flavors and they also come in different thicknesses, uh, thin, medium and heavy. And they look like this, okay. When you use a dental dam, you will need a frame and that helps to stabilize and stretch the dam so it fits tightly around the teeth and out of the operator's way. They come in plastic and metal, U-shaped, young frame, or what's called OTSB. So these are the different frames, okay? Notice they, um, they look like a U, all right? And they, this part down here on the bottom should be where the chin is. So if you have it wrong, uh, just turn it around. Then we have what's called a dental dam napkin, and this increases patient's comfort by absorb absorbing moisture between the patient's face and the dam. The primary purpose is to increase patient comfort by absorbing moisture. The napkin also protects the patient's face from direct contact with the dam, reducing the risk that the patient may develop a latex sensitivity. But again, We've been using latex-free, and we haven't really had any problems with it. Lubricants, so there's two types of lubricants that may be selected when the dam is placed. One is for the lips to ensure patient comfort. Some operators use zinc oxide ointment, others use petroleum jelly. Water-soluble lubricant is placed on the underside of the dam to help the dam material slide over the teeth and through the interproximal spaces. Petroleum jelly should not be used for this purpose because it breaks the dental dam. I can tell you right now, though, nine out of ten times, I rarely use any lubricant to slide over uh, the teeth because a lot of times there's saliva, and the saliva helps us with the uh, um, to slide the dental dam over the tooth. Then there's what's called a dental dam punch. This creates the hole in the dental dam that are needed to expose the teeth to be isolated. The working end has an adjustable stylus that makes the hole as it strikes an opening in the punch plate. The punch plate is a rotary platform with five or six holes of different sizes cut into the face of the plate. 
The position of the punch plate is rotated to produce holes of different sizes. So it looks like this. Okay, so this is the dental dam punch. By the way, this is the instrument that I told you that um, was put wet in a bag. And when I took out the bag, this whole thing was rusted. So it did not work. So this instrument, because of the dental dam punch, we cannot put it in the ultrasonic. It just gets wiped down, dried, and then put in a bag. Now, that plate has different holes, okay? So the there's uh, one through five. Five is the largest, one is the smallest, and it tells you which hole is for each tooth, okay? So that's something that you guys want to use because uh, study because if you are punching a hole in a dental dam for the doctor, you want to make sure you pick the right size, okay? Pretty much the molars get the biggest hole, the premolars get the medium holes, and of course the smaller teeth get the smallest holes. That's the best way to remember it. Then there's what's called a dental dam stamp. Don't get used to this stamp because a lot of doctors and offices don't have it. You would have to have the ink and the stamp, and then you use it as a template. <coughs> Excuse me. You use it as a template on the dental dam, so that way you know how to punch the holes uh, for the tooth that you're working on. The problem with the stamp is that the ink smears all over the place, on the patient, on our gloves, so a lot of doctors do not like to use it but they expect you to know where the uh, teeth are in the mouth. So if you know, you just kind of position this around their mouth and you just know where to mark it. The dental dam stamp and template. Uh, again, the stamp and ink pad is used to uh, predetermine the markings and you can use the templates and then mark the holes again, only if the office has it. Then you need the forceps. They're used in the placement and removal of the dental dam clamp. The beaks of the forceps fit into holes on the jaws of the clamp. There's a sliding bar that keeps the handles of the forceps in a fixed position. The handles are squeezed to release the clamp, and the beaks of the forceps are turned toward the arch being isolated. So it looks like this. Now, all these instruments and things that I'm mentioning to you, please know them, because when you do come to lab, you need to know them. Okay, in order for us to do these uh, checkoffs, uh, these hand skills, all right? So even though you might not be, for those of you that are not coming to lab right now, you still need to study them. So when you do come to lab, you're ready. Then there's what's called the dental dam clamps. <clears throat> the primary means of anchoring and stabilizing the dental dam. You have different parts of the clamp. You have the bow, which is the rounded portion of the clamp and the jaws. The prongs that seed around the tooth create the extension and balance ne necessary to stabilize the clamp. So the bow is this part in the back here, okay? The part that's lifted up on all the clamps. On here, the anterior, the bows are on the side. The jaws are these right here. They wrap themselves around the tooth, okay? The difference between uh, these clamps, these are anterior premolars and molars. And also, if you look at these two, 7 and W7, 7 means that they have these little side uh, bars here, and these are called wings. W7, W means wingless. They don't have those little um, wings over here. I prefer, I prefer the wings because it holds the dental dam better than the wingless. That's my preference. People have different preference. Again, you'll see what you like better. Now, the bow I mentioned is the rounded portion. The clamp is always positioned on the tooth so that the bow is located on the distal. So the bow always has to go towards the back of the tooth. The jaw encircles the tooth and they're shaped into four prongs. A hole is located on each side of the jaw of the clamp and that's where you put the beaks of the dental dam forceps. So coming back to here, if you see these little holes on the sides of the jaw, that's where you put this instrument in. So this instrument has these two little hooks on the end. You can't see it in this picture, but look on your Kindle and your instrument book. They should show you. And those two little, um, these forceps have these two little uh, clips that go into these holes, okay? And then 
uh, let's see. So you use the, the beaks of the forceps to place and remove the clamp. Now, the clamp is designed to fit on the cervical area of the tube below the height of contour or slightly below the cemento enamel junction. The wing clamps have extensions, as I mentioned to you. The posterior clamps are for the maxillary and mandibular posterior teeth. And the anterior clamps retract the gingiva on the facial surface and improve visibility. You have the ligature on clamps. So the ligatures are your important safety measures. It makes it possible to retrieve a clamp should it accidentally become dislodged and then inhale or swallow by the patient. So this is your ligature. Your ligature is also known as your safety line. So notice how it's on the bow. I normally put it on the bow because you can slide it right or left. Some people put it in the hole and it's just a hot mess when they put it in the hole because if they put it on the wrong side, then they have to take off the whole clamp just to change the floss. So honestly, it's best that you put it on the bow and then you just slide it to whatever area you need it for. Then there's something called the dental dam stabilizing cord. It is a latex cord that it is an alternative to the conventional clamp method of securing the dental dam. They come in three sizes, extra small, small, and large. And during insertion, the cord is stretched so that it becomes narrow and slips easily between the teeth. Once placed and released, the cord resumes its original shape and holds the dams tightly in place. I'll be real honest with you. The only time you really need the cord is if you're working on more than one tooth. If you're working, let's say, up to four teeth, because you definitely have to make sure that the dental dam is on all four teeth and it doesn't slip up. So when we come to lab again, I will make sure that you practice that. Now, dental dam preparation, pre-planned to accommodate dentist preference, tooth or teeth involved. So you want to make sure you know your mandil maxillary mandibular arch, the curve of the arch, the malaligned teeth. So let's say that somebody has a crooked tooth and that's the one you're working on. Well, you got to make sure when you punch the hole, you accommodate that uh, crooked tooth. Uh, teeth to be isolated, the key punch hole and hole sizing and spacing. Again, you need to know the punch plate in order to know which hole goes on the right tooth. <clears throat> There's two methods used for placement. There's the one step method, the dam and the clamp are placed at the same time. I am going to tell you right now for beginners that does not work. Okay. You cannot put the whole thing on the tooth if you've never done it before. You have to go in steps. Once you get really good at it, then yes, you can do everything together. Then there's the two-step method, uh, which is what I'm telling you. For beginners, do everything in steps, okay? The one step is like having everything, the clamp, the frame, the, uh, the rubber dam, the cord, everything. That's too much for you guys. So you're going to use the two-step method which really is, again, in steps. Now, special applications, the anterior teeth. Again, look at the clamp because the clamp is different for anterior um, and uh, different from the anterior and the posterior. Stabilizing the cervical clamp, <clears throat> soft. Sometimes we use a soft and stick compound that we could use for this purpose. It's very rare. And fixed bridge. When you have a bridge and you're working on a tooth that's attached to the bridge, you have to make a big hole to fit the entire bridge. So that's a little bit uh, dicey, but uh, I can show you how to do that too when you come to lab. And does anybody have any questions? No questions? 